So there was this little girl who was watching her mother cook a roast beef, and she watched her mother take the roast, put it on the counter, and chop it in half, and then roast the, the two pieces. And she said, Mom, why do you cut the, the roast in half? Reptiles have an analogous structure in their brain to mammals, which is our hippocampus. And your hippocampus is what takes care of all the spatial awareness. I don't want the ball python people to come and attack me. I mean, they're welcome to do that if you want. I'm, I'm... All right, so I'm finally going to add the jungle carpet python into his new enclosure. I am very excited. It's been about two weeks for me since I released both the build and this video on the same day for you. Maybe it's only been about a second if you happen to watch the build version of this, uh, the video of this series. But it took for me about two weeks to stop smelling the smell of silicone. So I am good to go now. I am very excited to do this. And if you are new to my channel, I'll give you a quick update about what's going on here. So I have a relatively large enclosure. It's about three feet tall by two feet by two feet. And I'm an introducing a relatively small jungle carpet python into this enclosure. I am looking at busting that myth that we hear all the time in the reptile hobby, which is small snakes in large enclosures fail to thrive due to stress. I don't think that's true. I think there are parts of that that are true. I think it's largely false. And I think it seems to be something that has carried over from the industrial breeding side to things, as well as maybe an artifact of ball python care that's just sort of disseminated across other all other species of snakes in the hobby. So I want to talk about all of that. And I, I'm going to break all of this down in a second. I'm going to go add the snake and I'm going to be honest with you, it's going to be a lot less exciting than you're hoping for. I know everybody wants to see the big reveal, see the snake climb up and down the branches and whatnot, but I'm actually a lot more concerned about the health and of the snake rather than the excitement of the video. So I'm going to show you how we're going to take care of this and, uh, and then we'll go from there. Right, so I'm sure many of you found that to be quite underwhelming, and I definitely agree with you. That was definitely a boring cage reveal, and don't worry, I'm going to be cutting in some shots of him exploring the cage and whatnot, so there, that, that is to come, but I did want to make sure I did it this way, and some of you are probably thinking, wow, Dylan does not understand YouTube. YouTube is for clickbait and sensationalized video. And uh, I do understand YouTube and that's why I created a podcast because I don't enjoy working on sensationalized video. I do want to make sure that this is clearly explained and I'm, I'm doing it in this way to maybe teach others how they can introduce their animal into a new environment. So as far as I can tell, there are sort of two different ways I could have introduced the snake to his new, his new cage. The first was obviously I could have grabbed him by hand and I could have thrown him into the, the cage just that way. Now, he, he's a pretty small snake. He's about two feet long and maybe the thickness of about a, sh a medium sized Sharpie. He's about 70 grams. So when I'm handling him, he's never aggressive or anything. He doesn't strike or bite or anything, but he is pretty flighty. He does move. He is kind of trying to get away uh, while he's in my hands. So you you know for sure he's in that sort of a stressed state. And if I were to grab him from that state and put him into this enclosure, he's going to be stressed. And I'm trying to do my best to research and understand how a reptile brain works. And fr from what I can tell, it seems like the mammalian brain and the reptile brain have a lot of sort of analogous structures. And you know, one of those main structures is the hypothalamus, which is the mid part of your brain. Your hypothalamus deals with survival. It's what regulates your temperature. It's what drives you to eat. It's what it's that fight or flight response It's what tries to get you away when you're in in danger. When I pick up a snake, it's essentially a large predator picking you up. It's basically worst case scenario that is going to cause panic or stress, a cortisol response in the animal. Now, if I take that animal who's clearly stressed and put him into this new environment, it could take him days just to get over that initial stress, let alone begin to explore and be comfortable in the enclosure. For one, it takes reptiles a long time to become comfortable in, in new enclosures, but putting them in to an enclosure that way, it's just asking for trouble when I'm trying to make sure this is a sort of a smooth transition into his new environment. So obviously the second way is putting his his old tub directly into the enclosure. I got really lucky the fact that it actually fits in there and now I can let him explore the territory on his own terms. Now I'm not going to see him for the rest of the day. He never comes out during the day or, or mostly doesn't come out during the day. At nighttime I quite often find him on the wood perches that I have inside his tub. Now I suspect that tonight he'll probably do the same. He may not be aware that he's in a new cage he might spend the next three or four days just doing his regular routine of, of ending up on the wooden perches without realizing that there's this vast space above him that he can explore. But eventually, the hypothalamus is going to start kicking in again because it's going to drive his hunger. And 
that will drive him to start exploring the the the, in, the terrarium or the enclosure that's how i want him to be introduced to the environment i want it to almost be like he thinks he escaped and he's in this new environment and he can kind of go explore because the other part of his brain that's going to be firing when he is exploring on his own terms is his forebrain which is the front part of his brain now from what i can tell from reading i'm really hoping that maybe a reptile brain expert can jump in on the comments but what it looks like to me is that reptiles have an analogous structure in their brain to mammals which is our hippocampus and your hippocampus is what takes care of all the spatial awareness and mapping so it's what will allow a, ma uh, a, a rat to run through a maze and memorize the steps that that's where the hippocampus comes into play and I don't know if reptiles have a hippocampus or something that just acts a lot like a hippocampus, but without a doubt, there's spatial awareness happening. That there's there's tons of evidence to show that reptiles have the ability to map an environment. That's the two parts of his brain that I want firing. I want him to be exploring, mapping new territory, with that being driven from his hunger response rather than fear and stress and trying to hide. So that's why I did it this way. Again, I'm going to cut in some shots of, of him exploring once he does that. So it's the next day and it's pretty cool. As I was looking at him last night, I kind of snuck into the reptile room. Hopefully I'm cutting in some of those shots now. He was just starting to explore. So just kind of poking his head out. This morning when I came in at about five in the morning, he was kind of just perched on the edge of the tub. It almost looked like he was thinking, okay, this is very unusual. There's no lid over top of me anymore. So that was really cool to see. That's what I'm hoping to see over the next few days. Let him explore. I'm guessing his domain of comfort will expand over the next few days and then eventually we'll we'll try to feed him and see how it goes um, so if you are introducing an animal and you have a sort of a timid animal that you're worried about introducing into a larger enclosure i would definitely recommend trying to incorporate something from their smaller enclosure into the into the new enclosure now obviously again i got fortunate because the entire enclosure fit in but maybe you have a hide maybe you can move an entire hide box into a new enclosure and that way there's that area that they've already mapped and they're already comfortable with and they can return to that and then they'll slowly explore on their own. I wanted to return to the original myth that I talked about at the beginning of the video, which is small snakes in large enclosures fail to thrive due to stress. Now that's sort of just a blanket general statement that you hear all the time. There are certainly parts of that are true. There are certainly large parts of it that are false. And I think that is one of the main issues in the reptile hobby is we have a lot of rules of thumb like that, that don't seem to have a lot of scientific backing. And I, I'm, I suspect there are a lot of artifacts of you know when we were just starting the hobby maybe 10 15 years ago where people were just learning how to take care of these animals just to get them to you know live in kept captivity let alone breed and as people got better and better they started finding certain things that work and some of these things just i think stuck in the hobby without really any grounds for for evidence or people are doing things without understanding why they're doing them and it kind of makes me think of this old wives tale that i heard when i was probably eight years old i heard it on the radio and i'll never forget it and it kind of reminds me of a situation like this so there was this little girl who's watching her mother cook a roast beef and she watched her mother take the roast, put it on the counter and chop it in half and then roast the, the two pieces. And she said, mom, why do you cut the, the roast in half? And she said, I don't know. That's just what my mother always did. So they went to grandma's house and asked grandma, why do you cut the roast in half? And she said, she said the same thing. I'm not sure. That's, that's how my mother always did it. So that's how I've always done it. And then they go to the great grandmother, the third generation and ask, or I guess this would be the fourth generation and ask great grandmother, why did you used to cut the roast in half when you cooked it? And then she looked at them and said, well, I didn't have a pan large enough to hold the full roast. And I, I do have a feeling that we have a lot of things like that in the hobby where they're just little artifacts of information that maybe worked for somebody. And now they're just modern day knowledge in the reptile hobby without a lot of backing. So I think the myth of the small cages comes from, well, one, I think it obviously comes from the industrial breeding side. We have the fact that people are stacking a lot of snakes in small areas. It's just convenient to have that, to sort of perpetuate that myth that snakes do better in smaller cages. And then, then there's also the, the fact that people are buying snakes from breeders that are used to being in a tub. So I call that like the tub comfort syndrome where you have an animal that's been in a tub for two or three years and you give it to somebody who is their only pet and they try to set up like in a large elaborate enclosure and the, 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 you know, the animal doesn't do well because it's stressed out. Now that doesn't mean that larger enclosures aren't good. It just means that we need to learn a, what type of enclosure should you be setting up and two or and B learning how to introduce the animal into a new environment properly so they don't get too stressed. And I think the other area this myth sort of perpetuates from is the ball python keepers. A lot of them 
tend to say this a lot. You see a lot on Facebook and whatnot. People say they should be kept in small tubs because they're burrowing animals and the tub should be set up like a burrow. And I totally get that. That's that's for sure. That makes sense to me. But the problem is, is I'm the things I'm seeing online all the time are that ball pythons spend all of their time in a burrow and don't do anything else. That's why the tub should be set up in that way. So I went out and I looked for academic evidence to support those claims. So basically I was looking for, do, bi do ball pythons spend all their time underground? Do they spend any time above ground? What are, what are their behavioral tendencies? And I did not find a single source that didn't say ball pythons actively hunt at nighttime. So every source I found, books, academic papers, all said at nighttime these animals are active and that's when they come out and they actively hunt. And quite often you see in the ball python community that people claim that ball pythons don't hunt. I'm actually not sure where that information is coming from. If someone has that information, please put it in the comments because I'd actually really like to see that because I, I scoured the internet everywhere through, through my, the academic de database that I have access to at the university and I can't find any information that makes that claim. So what that means is yes, ball pythons do like to be burrowed. They, they seem to be find, are, are found most of the time in rodent burrows, uh, in the savanna, so they're not really in forested areas, but they do spend a lot of time uh, underground, but they do also spend a lot of time above ground at nighttime, that's when they're more active. And in fact, that's when the, the, when the people that go out and try to ca wild or catch and collect wild caught ball pythons, they specifically do it during the daytime because they know that's when they're going to find them in their, their rodent holes and, and whatnot. So I think the, if someone were to take a big ball or a ball python and put it in a large enclosure with only one or two hides, yes, the ball python's probably going to fail to thrive. It's probably going to be stressed, but instead maybe these enclosures should be set up in a way where there's two or three or four different hides that behave a lot like or, or seem a lot like a rodent hide or a rodent hole, but this still allows them to come out at night and have a full range where they can stretch out and fully stretch out and move from one side of the enclosure to the other, but then also being able to return to, you know, at the daytime where they hide and, and end up inside a rodent hole. Because there, there are also people that say, you know, as long as you have, a, if you have a large enclosure, that's okay, as long as you clutter it up. And I know a lot of ball python people really hate that. And I actually don't love that as well, because it, kind of implies that you haven't necessarily done the research for the animal that you're setting up. So what you need to be doing is making sure the enclosure is being set up in a way that facilitates the animal's natural behaviors. And so for instance, this enclosure was set up with the jungle carpet python in mind. I know that in the wild, they can be found on the ground. So hence lots of floor space for him. They're often found in trees. They're semi-arboreal, found in trees all the time. Uh, they're found in the hollows of trees. So any places that are sort of hollowed out, you can find them in there hiding. And they're also found basking a lot. You actually find them in the wild out in the sun. So there's elements of all of that in this enclosure. There's a little light at the top. There's some heat from the top that can simulate some basking behavior. Lots of trees, lots of different burrows and whatnot, and lots of ground space. So I'm trying my best to replicate what a jungle python might encounter in the wild and that's what he's programmed to deal with so he should naturally utilize this stuff but if you were to put a snake that's used to burrowing in a large enclosure with only one or two hides it may get very uncomfortable and stressed so the point i'm trying to make here is it's not that large enclosures stress out animals and i know most of you guys know this and a lot of you know this but i i, I constantly see this being perpetuated on the internet people say actually ball pythons for example need to be kept in small dark quiet burrows because that's or tubs because they spend all their time in burrows and it's just not true I just cannot find any information to support that so I think that's one of the directions that we can head in the hobby so having said all of that obviously I don't believe that large enclosures will stress out a snake to the point where it's going to fail to thrive but I do absolutely believe and this is where me and the ball python people definitely agree that the enclosure needs to be set up in a way that replicates their natural environment now the only place that I would disagree with with maybe the the tub people is that the snake does still need to have an exposure to be able to be stretched out and move because at nighttime they they are active at night they do actively hunt according to everything I can find if again if you have information that says otherwise please post it in the comments because I'm trying to learn just like everybody else but we want the animals to be exhibiting natural behavior and that should be your goal no matter what and I think the tendency of ball python owners keeping their animals in smaller enclosures has definitely seeped into other snake species in the hobby and now it's just become sort of a given piece of knowledge when there's not a lot of evidence backing that up so it's now the third day so this is the third day this animal has been in the enclosure you can see I'm cutting in some shots of him exploring so it really only took one 
night, one full night and one day for him to get comfortable in the enclosure. So the second full night he was in, he as soon as the lights went out, he popped his head up and started exploring. And within about 10 minutes, he was climbing up to the top. He explored the whole thing. Uh, I eventually went to bed because I'm a, I'm a morning person, not a night owl. So it was getting close to 11. And for me, that's well past my bedtime. So I, I, I let him explore it on his own. And that way, you know, not bugging him with the flashlight and whatnot. And when I came back this morning, he was back in his tub. So I'm going to leave that tub in there for a couple more days probably and eventually let him uh, get used to the environment a little bit more and then I'll pull the tub out and uh, we'll go from there. So really what motivated me to specifically talk about the ball python link to this myth was and I wasn't planning on talking about them at all in this video I just wanted to talk about you know setting up the enclosure to relate to the spe uh, species specific setup but I saw this post on Facebook the other day and it was essentially it was on one of the ball python Facebook groups and someone had made a post about you know, the, a, a screenshot of somebody had set up an enclosure, they had cluttered it up and, you know, it was a larger enclosure and they were really proud of themselves because they set up this enclosure. Now, it wasn't the best, it wasn't set up in the best way. It, it really wasn't designed for a ball python, but it was larger and they were kind of proud of themselves for, for offering their snake a, a larger enclosure. And of course, the people on Facebook, instead of helping, instead of providing some knowledge, instead they just patronize this person and, and condescendingly you know, make fun of the fact that they clearly don't know what they're talking about. This person has no clue how ball pythons live because ball python, and this, this is like almost direct quotes from the, these ball python experts on Facebook you know, ball pythons spend all of their time in termite mounds and they're underground and they need to be in a small enclosure and whatnot. And it's just, they aren't helping. And not only are they not helping, they could have actually taken this opportunity to teach this individual maybe a different way of care. But anyway, not only are they not helping, they're actually spouting information that's not accurate. So, so it's, sort of ironic in a sense that they were kind of making fun of this person for not understanding how to care for a ball python while simultaneously spouting incorrect information. And you see it all the time and it, it becomes like almost tribal. People get really, really personally associated with the way they care for their animals and they don't allow themselves to grow and they don't allow themselves to learn new information and change. And it's kind of a frustrating thing where where we should all be sharing and learning together because the goal at the end of the day should be to take care of the animal in the best possible way, to give the animal the best possible life. But instead, it's like we get personally bound to our care styles and now you have somebody making fun of another individual while well, they're both wrong. The animals are in both cases are the ones that are losing. But this is what I'm pretty sure is true. Actually, I want you to do something with me really quick. I want you to, you don't have to close your eyes. If you're listening to this on the podcast version and you're driving, please don't close your eyes. But I want you to really think about the first time or your first pet reptile. Think about why you wanted to get it. Were you a kid? How old were you? Did you have to convince your parents? What drew you towards that reptile? What was the first reptile where you were like, I need that, I want that? For some reason, for me, it was a green anole. I just... I just love them. I love green lizards. And that was what first got me looking at reptiles. It wasn't my first reptile because I couldn't find them where I lived. My first reptile was a crested gecko, which I got in 2007 when I was 16 or 17. And he is still in my reptile room today. He's well over 15 years old. That was my first reptile. But do you remember what got you into the hobby? What drew you towards it? Just think about it. Because here's what I know. No matter the differences in opinions in the way we care for the animals, we all have one common thing, and that is that we all have a passion for the animals. There's something about the animal that we're drawn to. We want to look at them. We want to interact with them. We want to own them. And it's not just reptiles. A lot of us are you know, passionate about many different types of animals. And it's very strange. We all have this. So we are all more alike than we are different in that sense, especially when we're talking about the hobby in general. We, we all have this same passion and a lot of times we forget that and we become divided. And that's why I, I want to mention this because I don't want the ball python people to come and attack me. I mean, they're welcome to do that if you want. I'm, I'm, I'm okay if you do attack me, but, but really what I, I want us all to learn and grow together and understand that we are actually really, really alike. So one of the examples that I can think that has nothing to do with animals is I used to be a competitive swimmer and 
I always found myself really viscerally hating the, the guys I raced against, the people who I didn't know them at all. They were just people from across the country and I would just develop this hatred for them and I would avoid them on deck and whatnot. And then, you know, once in a while you would end up interacting with these people. Maybe it was in the warm down tank after a race and you end up saying, hey, good job. And you, you get to talking and then quickly you realize you're actually really alike. You've both been swimming for 15 years. You both have the same interests. You're both very competitive. And it turns out those people are, you know, you and your competitor are very close. And, you know, as a coach, it's one of the things I tell my swimmers all the time. You shouldn't hate your competition because they're you're probably actually really close friends with them or you could be close friends with them. And, and that, that was my experience. And, and that's what I think is happening here. I think that is a perfect analogy for, you know, people attacking other people when we forget that we're all here for the same reason. It's for the passion for the animals. And I cannot tell what that passion is or where it comes from. And it's one of the reasons I started the podcast was, I wanted to figure out why people are drawn to animals because you know, as an animal lover, you know that a lot of people don't care about animals at all and they can't tell you the difference between a white-tailed deer and a moose or something, you know? They're, they're, and it, as an animal lover, you always get confused, like, how can you can't distinguish the different types of animals out there? But it, it there are people who just don't care about animals and then there are us. I started the podcast because I really wanted to kind of narrow that down what is that passion? Where does it come from? And I ha still have no clue. I've maybe spent about 30 hours talking to different people, people who wake up, live, breathe, and do everything associated with animals. And I'm still not sure what it is that's drawing us towards them. You know, maybe it'll take a thousand hours of conversation before I narrow it down. But it, it is really fascinating to me. You know, and one of the ideas that I came up with uh, last week while I was thinking about this was you know, maybe there was an evolutionary advantage. And right now I'm going off on an extreme tangent. Maybe there was an evolutionary advantage for having a members of our community and members of the society that you live in to have an affinity towards animals. Because when you think about it, beasts of burden, like your, your horses, your cows, your ox, camels, they were integral to our success as a species. They were integral to us being able to grow and create giant societies and communities. And those animals had to be domesticated. And I could guarantee you that the people that are domesticating those animals or who did domesticate those animals, you know, five, 10,000 years ago, they must have been drawn to animals for some reason. There must have been something that they would have been interested in because you're not going to go try to tame a, you know, a 2,000 pound ox uh, if you aren't interested in it, you know, so maybe that's what it is. I have no clue. Maybe we have, you know, these little remnants of of uh, an attraction towards wildlife that not everybody has. And and it's stuck around because it was so advantageous for for our societies. I just made that up. Maybe that's true. Maybe that's completely false. I have no clue. And as an exotic animal owner, I do really hope that ownership of these animals creates a net positive on the planet somehow and that's really to me what's the most important because and that's why i ask you to think about why you got into the animal in the first place what drew you towards them because that is the reason that you got into it and that's really the reason that we should stay in this hobby is for that first spark of interest because and then you can use that to you know promote conservation promote captive breeding and and all the great things that can come from pet ownership as well as you know getting people involved in animals at a young age and maybe eventually they go on to be a biologist and whatnot and those are the stories I get on my podcast all the time. You know, being exposed to pets at a young age is often the reason that people go into science. But I do think many of us in the hobby are drifting away from that first interest, that first spark that got you into the hobby. And now, and now it's turning into people try to do it for, for money. Like the morphic, morph market is a perfect example. Think about this. If we didn't have ball python morphs, would people be breeding them on the same scale they are now? The answer is no. Nobody would set up a rack of ball pythons to continue to produce regular normal ball pythons, which tells you that the morph has become more valuable than the animal, which is not why you got into reptiles. You didn't get into reptiles because you really liked a ball python morph. You got into reptiles because you really liked ball pythons. You liked snakes. You, you liked the animal. It had nothing to do with the color of skin. I'm, I'm almost guaranteed. I would be very surprised if someone said, hey, I just really liked the way that cinnamon 
fire blast, whatever, whatever uh, morphs there are. I really like the way that looks, so I'm going to get into reptiles. It's never that. And then people get in, and then they assume that you can make money. And, and I think that's one of the issues is that we have too many people in the hobby that have, have let themselves drift away from that in, initial interest, that initial spark, and they're trying to turn it into a business. And you can't do that. I have been involved in, in entrepreneurship in a way. I've, I've ran a couple businesses, small businesses to do with sports, and it is so hard to make money. It is almost impossible to make money. And if you are producing a product that eats and needs to, you know, you know they poop and they take up time and effort, that's going to be a very difficult business to run. It's not like you're printing shirts and then they can sit in a box. Like your product is eating away at your, your capital. And and I think that's sort of the way we're drifting. And I, I, I would love to be part of the process of bringing us back to that initial interest. And morphs are cool, no doubt about it. But it's not why we got into it. So anyway, I know that I'm really going off on the deep end in terms of this video is just supposed to show you this large enclosure, but it all is tied together. I'm showing you this large enclosure because I want us to shift away from myths that perpetuate stacking animals and and not giving the animal exposure to what it would encounter in its natural daily life in the wild. And I really do think we've stopped treating our animals like individuals and we've started treating everything like a collection. And when we start treating things like a collection, the specific individual care that is required for each animal starts to degrade and there's just no way around it. So anyway, to wrap up, I, I do think that we all need to do a better job of remembering why you got that first animal because it's so easy to always want something more, another animal, another animal, another animal. It's incredibly addicting and the more animals you get, as I said, the care starts to degrade and we actually enjoy the process of getting a new animal more than owning the animal and you all know what I'm talking about after three months of a new animal you're already starting to look at different animals and I think that's a serious issue in the hobby and and promoting getting the animals to act in a natural way and to enjoy that part of the animal is the direction the hobby needs to head And that is a convoluted way to add a small snake into a large enclosure. Well, if you made it to the end of this video, thank you so much for listening to the entire thing. If you have your own thoughts and feelings and opinions, definitely drop them in the comments below so I can take a look. If you are interested in an update on this guy to see how he's faring in his large enclosure to see if he eats and whatnot, definitely hit subscribe and eventually I will do an update video to let you guys know how he is faring.